Okay, today we're going to make a really quick chicken and dressing. I cooked a whole chicken last night, and since it's just me and my husband, there was a lot left over. So this is the leftover chicken. In here we have a large pan of cornbread that has been cooked and then broke up in the pan with one teaspoon of sage, one teaspoon of dried celery, a teaspoon of black pepper, and a little bit of seasoning salt. Um, to that we're going to add chopped onion. In here I have a whole chopped onion, two chopped garlic cloves, and because I try to sneak piper, because I try to sneak vegetables in anywhere I can, one shredded carrot. We're going to add in one stick of melted butter. Stir that up some. Now we also have two beaten eggs, but we're going to wait until the last minute to add that in case we need to taste it to see if we need to adjust the seasonings. You don't want to taste it once you've added a raw egg to it. And then we have our chicken broth. Normally I would use low sodium chicken broth, but they didn't happen to have that. I try to cut back on salt wherever I can since my chronic illnesses don't like sodium and I have to really watch my sodium intake. And when you put the chicken broth in there, you want to really give it a good stir to make sure that you have enough broth in it because that cornbread is going to really soak up the liquid pretty quick. And while I'm checking that to see if that's enough, I'm going to cut the oven on to preheat to 375. Now one pan of this we'll have tonight and then I will put another pan in the freezer for later. Because <clears throat> my freezer stash of frozen meals are is just about gone. Do you see that? I don't know how well it will pick up on the camera. That is the consistency that you want. Not too wet, not too dry. Now we're going to add in our chicken much more chicken than I had anticipated so this chicken and dressing is going to be really full of chicken normally I don't buy a whole chicken since it is just me and my husband but Kroger's happen to have those whole bacon chickens that are usually ten or eleven dollars they had them on sale for four and five dollars so I picked one up now you see once you add the chicken in there, it starts to get a little bit dry. So we're going to add in some more broth. I normally don't measure things when I cook. I just look at it and know what it's supposed to look like. So this is one big box of chicken broth with a cast iron skillet that was this size of cornbread. box. It normally will take this whole box to do a big thing of chicken and dressing. Because the last thing you want is dry chicken and dressing. Let's see. Seasoning's good. We don't need to add anything so we're going to go ahead and put our eggs in. 
this is two beaten eggs. Get it really well mixed up because that egg is what it helps to hold the dressing together, but it also gives it a little fluffiness. Now to my chicken and dressing. Oh, if I can reach it. I like to add a pinch and it's literally a pinch, a pinch of baking soda. That also helps it to be just a little bit fluffy. You don't want to add a lot of baking soda because you'll taste it and it'll be icky. Um, some people put chopped fresh celery in their dressing. My husband is not a big fan of celery, so I just add in a little dehydrated celery just to give it a little flavor without having that texture of fresh celery in it. Now I have two pans out. Oh, oh cooking when you're short is rough. Sometimes you gotta use a spoon to reach what you need. Okay. <laughs> Non-stick spray. I'm gonna spray my pans down really well. Some people prefer to butter their pan. Sometimes I'll do that, but today we're just going to use a little spray. My mom always used lard to grease up her pans, but I can't do that anymore. Now we have two pans that we're going to break this down into. Because like I said, one's going to go for a dinner today and my husband's lunch tomorrow. And then the other one will go in the freezer because I've got to get my freezer meals built back up. You don't want to make the dressing that you put in the pan too thick in the pan. Because then it will be undone and a little mushy in the middle. And too dried out on the edges. So you don't want it to be... A really thick layer in your pan. actually a little thicker than I care for it to be but this one's gonna go in the freezer so it will get cooked a little more when it comes out of the freezer to be heated up. Now we're gonna put these in a 375 degree oven for about 45 minutes. You just kind of have to check them when they start getting golden brown around the edges and on the top and they don't jiggle wiggle they're done. And we'll be back to see the finished product. Okay, while our dressing is getting all yummy yummy in the oven, we are going to make the gravy. Now, people think that gravy is intimidating and hard to make. It really isn't. Um, I have to excuse my green goblin here, but it, it, it's pretty easy to make it. You start with a, preferably a cast iron skillet. If you've watched my channel, you know how I feel about cooking with cast iron. Whatever kind of oil you want, just enough to cover the bottom unless you're trying to make a really enormous amount of gravy. Then you're going to take your all-purpose flour, the best being white lily, sprinkle it in the pan. You want enough flour to absorb the amount of oil you have in the pan. An important thing to know about making gravy is keep your whisk handy because you don't want your gravy to scorch to the bottom of the pan, but you do have to let it cook because nobody wants to eat gravy with raw flour. It's gross. Now 
this is just going to be brown gravy because it's going over the dressing. Once that flour gets all absorbed in the oil, you can let it cook a little bit and we're going to add into it two chicken bouillon cubes. You can use packaged gravy mix if you like. I don't care to do it that way. It tastes kind of chemically to me, but you want to keep your flour moving in your pan. Because you don't want to scorch it, but you have to get that flour cooked. to it a little bit of black pepper. I'd say maybe a teaspoon. And I add in a little garlic. We like garlic around here. It's good for you. Now when your flour and your oil mixture starts to turn a little bit dark, then you slowly add in a little water. You want to start making your roux. This is not the gravy itself, this is your roux. And again, you have to let that roux cook. And how much water you add, you learn with experience. You don't want your roux to be too thick and you don't want it to be too watery. So it's best to just add the water a little bit at a time. And I can't give you measurements because it depends on how much oil you use and how much flour you use. You just have to eyeball it and know what it should look like. And remember to keep your whisk or your spoon, whatever you're using, moving in your pan so that it doesn't scorch while your flour is cooking. Now, do you see how that looks? Oh, it is so hot in here, I'll tell you what, I do not know how my grandmother did it. My Granny Blackburn with no air conditioning and a sink you had to pump the water into and no indoor plumbing, and this was in the 70s. Cooking three meals a day, and oh goodness gracious, it's too hot. And I have window air conditioning, she didn't have anything but a fan and a door. but she was a fantastic cook and she taught me quite a bit. My granny's been gone quite a few years. She was actually born the same year this house was built in 1907. Both of my parents were raised during the depression They were very poor farmers who, some of them share crops, some of them own their farm. They both had a lot of kids, six kids on one side, 10 kids on the other. And they did what they had to do to take care of their children by themselves. So my parents made sure that we knew how to do things like grow food, prepare food, can food, preserve food, cook for yourself. And I tried to impart those same things same lessons to my children. Some paid attention, some didn't. Okay, now we're going to start slowly adding a little more water because our roux is cooked. And this is why it's best to use a whisk instead of a spoon, especially a metal whisk and a cast iron skillet. Because you need to blend it in and a whisk does that best. You don't want lumpy gravy.
once you get it blended in you add a little more water and this is just a guessing game as well it depends on how thick you want your gravy you just keep adding the water running that whisk around and when it looks like it is to the consistency that you like you turn it down to low and let it simmer for about 10 minutes but you need to be sure that you are constantly moving this whisk and give the gravy time to absorb that water because as it cooks it gets thicker so you may think it's thin right now but as it cooks it's not going to be thin if you grew up with grand grandmothers grandfathers that cooked a lot, taught you how to cook. What was your favorite meal? Leave it in the comments down below. My granny's was always gravy, biscuits, black eyed peas, and fried chicken. Fried green tomatoes. Everything that she cooked came from their own farm. If they didn't grow it or kill it, they didn't eat it. Another tip too is keep your flour and your cornmeal in the freezer, especially during these hot months. It makes it last longer. If you keep flour too long and it's not in the freezer, it can develop little bitty weevils in it and that's disgusting. So keep your flour and your cornmeal in the freezer. Okay, I think that's good for right now. You see it is not thick. Right now it looks like it's very watery, but once it sits here and it simmers, it's going to get quite thick. So I'm gonna turn it down and let it simmer and we'll be back when the dressing's all yummy dummy done. And this is what it looks like when it comes out of the oven. Golden around the edges, no jiggly wiggly in the middle of it, and it's gonna be delicious.